Thank you. The poet Wallace Stevens once wrote that after the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. Unless environmentalism evolves, history will judge it as just another big idea that never got fully implemented. For the last 15 years, I've been working with rivers, and I've come to the single realization that if we want to have clean water in this country in the long term, we have to radically accelerate the pace and the scale of restoration in the near term. To do that, we're going to have to fundamentally change how conservation happens. Let me explain. Let me explain. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Lost a little drama there. <laughs> um, <laughs> rivers are not supposed to burn, right? In 1969, the year that I was born, this image of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio enraged the United States. That rage led to the nation's first environmental laws. The laws were in direct response to an economy that was taking too much from its environment. The movement operated like a great big green wall of no and put the procedures in place to keep bad things from happening. Fast forward 43 years. Just because our rivers aren't burning anymore doesn't mean they're healthy. Now, the biosphere is the ultimate closed loop. We don't have any more water today or any less water uh, today than they did the day that the earth opened for business. That hasn't changed, it's remained constant. What has changed dramatically is the quality and the character of the water when it shows up, and even if it shows up. And that's because we have an open-ended accounting system in a closed loop world. People do not and cannot fully connect their actions to the environment. So the market-based decisions that we make every day really serve as a proxy for what it is we want. So whether you realize it or not, we are all deciding collectively the state of the environment that we have. And though we no longer see the flames, I can tell you that our rivers are burning. Because cities like Los Angeles, Denver, San Diego, Salt Lake, Phoenix take their cut first, the Colorado River, a river strong enough to carve the Grand Canyon out of stone, no longer is strong enough to make it to its own mouth. Because we all enjoy cheap food, the Mississippi River is so clogged with agricultural runoff and excess pesticides that every single year it gives birth to a dead zone the size of New Jersey. Ten years, or excuse me, ten times the size of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill every single year, right? And because we all want consumer goods that are made with water, the, pressure, the pressures on our resources are only going to go up. The cotton it took to make these blue jeans, 2,800 gallons of water. The coffee beans that, made your, that gave you your caffeine this morning, 35 gallons of water. And consumers are the ones that are going to have to think of this because the economy doesn't give a rip. And our environmental protections don't require it. My organization, excuse me, here on the West Coast, we have listed since the 1990s 28 species of endangered salmon. We have recovered none, zero. My organization listed that first salmon, and the point was not to put it on the list and keep it on the list. The point was to do enough good things to recover the fish and get it off. But the only job description enviros have ever gotten is hold the line. Holding the line is not enough anymore. It's just not. We are behind and falling further behind every day. We need gain. We need to restore our natural systems at a greater rate than we degrade our natural systems. 
But accelerating versus slowing things down is, is really not conservation's game historically, right? Conservation 1.0 to put in all the procedures to stop bad things from happening. But today, but today, I have to go through the same hoops to fix a stream as a guy who wants to strip gravel from a stream. And if you're trying to catch up, that's the wrong way to do it. Now, several years ago, we were working with a landowner on the south coast of Oregon. Wanted to fix a mile of stream. But to fix that mile of stream, it was only, well, to fix that mile, it was only going to take one week of work, one week of dirt work. But instead, we spent three and a half years in permitting and funding cycles to get the chance to do one week of work. And that's considered fast in this industry. Now, if that's fast, you might ask yourself, how long is it going to take us? This EPA map always bums me out. There's, a, there's one and a half million red lines on that map. In the state of Oregon, we have 115,000 stream miles. EPA says 30,000 of those stream miles are impaired. Another 50,000 are at risk. 80,000 stream miles we got to deal with in some form or fashion. Oregon, hands down, has the best system for restoration in the country, if not the world. Altogether, we complete maybe 600 projects a year. 600 projects a year. 600 into 80,000 equals never. <laughs> right? Nationally, things are worse. And if all we have are conservation 1.0 tools to fix that problem, it's never going to get done. Not on any timeline, not for any dollar figure. We've got to speed it up. And not by just a little bit, by orders of magnitude. Now, we know how to fix rivers. This is not a science problem. There are only 16 ways to fix a river. That's it. Not 50, not 9,000, 16. The problem is those 16 solutions get caught in a crossfire of procedures and agencies and funders and permits, and they just stall, right? So what we did, realizing this was a systems problem, is we took all of those requirements, shoved them into a software platform, and essentially built TurboTax for restoration. <laughs> so that tool, we tried it out a couple of years ago, we cut 70% off of project completion time. 70%. When was the last time you cut 70% off of anything? <laughs> right? Cut 70% off of me, I am this tall. <laughs> we also standardized the methods and the inputs to get this work done. This tool, technology for the first time, allows us to streamline or cut red tape without shortchanging the environment. This technology gives us pace. But we still got to deal with scale, right? Because rivers are cumulative systems. So we have, to, we have to fix complete river corridors, not a chunk of land here, chunk of land there, chunk of land over there, if we ever want to have fishable, swimmable, drinkable waters. But turning all those red lines to blue is a hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars solution. That's a fact. You cannot get around it. The only engine that I know of Muscular enough to bring that kind of dough to the game is the original boogeyman of the environment, the economy, right? So these two opposing forces have a problem. Money doesn't understand the environment, and the environment doesn't understand money. What we need is a lingua franca, right? A common currency so these things can do business. Now, the first step to making that happen is figuring out what benefits are generated through restoration. With this, with these kind of metrics, a restoration project like planting 50,000 trees is no longer just a good deed. It is a quantifiable unit of environmental uplift. It now translates into X units of quantified shade that can cool a stream, or Y units of quantified runoff that gets avoided, or Z numbers of wild fish benefits. And if somebody 
Well, and if you think about this, this sets, this sets the stage for an entirely new kind of counting, if not a new world. You want to do a unit of evil? Knock yourself out. It's going to cost you two, two units of good, right? <laughs> Gain with every single deal, every single transaction. We're catching up. We're catching up. Now, it's too bad this system wasn't in place at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, right? Better late than never. And so you've got to start where you are. So let's start with the basics. Everybody poops. <laughs> what, you don't poop? <laughs> I've got a children's book that'll prove it. <laughs> okay? Under the Clean Water Act, under the Clean Water Act, cities have to treat everything that we put down the drain. Right? When they treat it, they heat it up a lot of times, and when it comes back to the river, it's clean, but it's warm. Okay? Historically, they've only had a basic option of just plunking down a great big gray chilling tower to cool it. But with these new metrics, they can engage in restoration upstream that can more than offset their impacts. Now, this isn't just a big idea. This is a big idea that's being implemented right here in Oregon. Now, a while back, I heard uh, a story about the Rogue River in Oregon. Every year, uh, the Rogue is filled with, with salmon swimming upstream to spawn. But because factories were allowed to, uh, allowing warm water to run back into the river, the temperature was becoming too high for the salmon to survive. So to fix the problem, the town could have required the company to buy expensive cooling equipment, but that would have hurt the local economy. Instead, they decided to pay farmers and ranchers to plant trees along the banks of the river. And that helped to cool the water at a fraction of the cost. So it worked for business, it worked for farmers, it worked for salmon. That's pretty cool. So, city of Medford, southern part of the state, they're in compliance with the Clean Water Act. Ratepayers save $8 million. 100 restoration jobs are created right there. We pay landowners for growing bushels of nature, right? Best of all, the river wins. As far as I can tell, this is how we're going to put these rivers out, or <laughs> put these rivers out, perfect. <laughs> this thing's broke. <laughs> this is how we put those fires out forever. This is the model, right? 12,000 permit holders, just like the one the president just spoke of in the Northwest alone. 200,000 across the country. This model has legs. Technology, we gain pace. With the economy, we gain scale. And with gain, we're done putting out fires. That's the world that I want to live in. That's the world I'm going to live in. Thank you. <laughs>